Yes, time. Sri Guru Bhyo Namahari Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahaviryam Karavahai Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Tuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hari Om <coughs> Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Aviravir Mayedi Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ram Krishnam Jagad Gurum Pad Padmi Tayo Shritwa Pranamami Muhur <coughs> Dear friends, you all are most welcome to this virtual online meeting, commemorating the life and teachings of Holy Mother. Sri Sharda Devi. We had our puja on December 26th, 2021, but we could not arrange a talk due to the holidays. <clears throat> on Mother's last birth anniversary, we had readings by devotees. Therefore, we thought for a change this time welcoming uh, Maharaj, Srimad Swami, Tyagarananji Maharaj. And we requested him, he very kindly accepted our request and we are very grateful to him. We would have loved to have him physically, but due to the pandemic situation, we ha have to satisfy ourselves with this alternate virtual arrangement for which we tender our apology. And also we hope to have him physically in future. <clears throat> As you know, Rivard Maharaj is very thoughtful and eloquent speaker and well, as well as convincing and competent writer. We are grateful to him for sparing a little time for us today. I first saw Maharaj in our Belur Mat a few times maybe, but the memorable one was different. That was on 13th May. 2005, when I was going to Australia, and Maharaj so kindly came up to the airport to see me off. So that was very memorable. In, nine, in uh, 2013, I had little opportunity to serve him when I was in Australia, and we invited Revered Maharaj to deliver some lectures to commemorate the 150th birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. In August 2016, I went and visited Maharaj and he so kindly showed me around Boston and Enesquam, etc., historical places. So I'm very thankful and he's always uh, have 
love and affection on me. So I'm really very grateful. <clears throat> and regarding his uh, short bio data, I'll just read out a little so that we know his background. <clears throat> Swami Tyagananji joined the Ramakrishna order at the monastery in Mumbai in 1976 after graduating from the University of Mumbai in India. He received spiritual instruction, Mantra Diksha, from Holy Mother's disciple Swami Viresh, Vireshwarananji Maharaj and his monastic vows, that means sannyasa, from Swami Gambhirananji Maharaj. Besides Mumbai, that is from 1976 to 80, Tyagananji Maharaj served in the monasteries at Belurmat 1920 to 19, 90, 1980 to 1982. I'm sorry. New Delhi 1982 to 83 and Chennai 83 to 1997 and was sent to Boston in 1998 to assist Swami Sarvagatananji Maharaj. He is the Hindu chaplain at Harvard and MIT since 1999. And after Sarvagatananji's retirement in 2002, he was appointed head of the Vedan Society in Boston. Tyagananji Maharaj was editor of the English journal Vedant Kishari for 11 years, 1986 to 97, and has written translated and edited 14 books. He has presented papers at academic conferences and he gives lectures and classes at the Vedanta Society as well as at MIT, Harvard and on invitation other colleges and religious groups in North America. He has written a few books also, looking deeply Walking the walk, names are very important because that's a karma yoga manual and knowing the knower, a jnana yoga manual. A drop of nectar, that means Abhrita Vindu Upanishad. So we are very, uh, up, very fortunate to have him with us. As Swami Vivekananda wanted to have our hands, heads, and hearts developed. So here is the Swami. Here is a Swami who is really following Swamiji to develop all these qualities of hands, head, and heart. And in his life, who is Parishrami, Pavitra, Pandit, and also Premik, preserving, pre persevering, and then pure, erudite, and also loving. And the need of inculcating the life of Holy Mother is very important. You know, is, is it said, Tomar Jivane Lovia Jimon? So, getting life from your life. So gel is also life and also water. So it is said for Ganges. So we have to sustain, we have to develop our lives and we can get it from the life of great one, pure life and divine life that we find in the life of Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi. So this is a great occasion. On this occasion, I request Maharaj to present us the gifts of the Holy Mother that he say he, he said two gifts. She has given many gifts, but he'll, he'll uh, highlight at least two. So without taking much time, I invite Maharaj and who has so kindly accepted our invitation 
we are grateful for that and hopefully in future we'll have him i don't know when so much please om asatoma satkamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya prityorma amritam gamaya aviravir mahedhi rudrayatte dakshinam mukham tenamam pahi nityam may the divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us peace 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 thank you swami chandrashekhar anand ji for that very generous introduction um i'm and happy to be with all of you uh, virtually and um, the kind of times in which we live now uh, virtually is becoming more and more real in some sense although we are calling this a virtual reality and it is this all these talks over zoom we are already been kind of living in a virtual reality if god alone is real all our interactions with the world and everything that's not really real so it's already kind of a virtual reality so what we are doing now is kind of a a virtual reality inside another virtual reality uh but but about the topic a holy mother's two gifts uh, i thought about these gifts in the reason the word gift came to my mind it's because swami vivekananda defined religion as the eternal relationship between the eternal self and eternal god and every relationship every meaningful relationship that we have add some meaning to our life because if a relationship does not add a meaning to our life then that relationship is no longer no longer strong no longer stable no longer fun no longer enjoyable and so every meaningful relationship is meaningful because it adds some meaning and that meaning what we get in a relationship can be seen in terms of a gift and so although we do exchange gifts on special occasions like like birthdays and and new year and christmas and so on gifts are actually continually being exchanged in every relationship often times very subtly and if we don't pay attention to those gifts that every relationship brings upon us we are missing something important the same thing is true with regard to our relationship with god in fact spiritual life can be seen as a way of trying to discover what our true relationship with god is and in that sense therefore as students and devotees of holy mother sharda devi's life we can ask well what is the nature of our relationship when well, clearly she is a holy mother and that we are her children so the the broad contours of the relationship are actually already well established she is the mother and i am her child but it's not enough to just define it as a mother child relationship i can still say when will my relationship with mother will become meaningful in such a way that i am able to recognize the gifts that i get from her and what are the kind of gifts i am able to give to mother so those were the thoughts at the back of my mind when i thought of this title holy mother's two gifts earlier today just a few hours ago i was speaking at a function or a or a, or a talk hosted by our center in berlin in germany and there i spoke on ramakrishna's three gifts the the background for that is similar that what is the relationship our relationship with ramakrishna or holy mother or any of these divine personages and 
what are the things that become meaningful to us as a result of that relationship? In that context, I also mentioned, and just because I spoke about it just a few hours ago, it's a bit fresh on my mind and those ideas are still going on. And I see amongst you, some of you were there for that lecture as well. Um, so it was with regard to the idea of the incarnation or the avatar. It's a very fascinating subject because an avatar is a very mysterious being. An avatar is one who looks human from one side and a divine from the other. When you look at the incarnation, sometimes it looks as if the incarnation is just like one of us, very human, very relatable in every way. You look at the same being at different times from a different perspective, and suddenly the being appears like, no, this person cannot be human. This person is actually divine. So this intermingling of the human and the divine, and we don't see that, that common and so constantly in a person, that is what makes this avatar a, a very mysterious figure, a figure that's not often understandable. And in that context, I said, one of the gifts that all these divine personages bring to us are among the three kind of a general gifts are their divine form, because many of us who, for whom Holy Mother Sharda Devi has a special place in our heart. She is the object of our adoration, of our worship. Our prayers are directed to her. We meditate on her. So her form is very sacred to us. And the forms of these divine figures are, while they are forms like any other form, they are special because meditating on this divine form of mother we are able to transcend our limitations, something that we cannot do by meditating any of these perishable forms of the material world. Same with regard to her name, the name of mother or the mantra associated with mother is something that can also take us beyond our limitations. And finally, the incidents from her life. Those of you who are associated with the the Portland Center for many years have been very lucky in that sense that for so many years, it was being led by Swami Aseshanandaji Maharaj, who was a disciple of Holy Mother. So those of you who are in Portland or those of you who have had a chance to meet with Swami Aseshanandaji or meet with any of these disciples of Holy Mother know the great blessing that comes through that association. And so it really makes me happy that uh, a function that is hosted by the Portland Center, that I get a chance to share with you some thoughts on Holy Mother's life. So these are the three common gifts we find in the coming from these divine personages, their form, their name, and these incidents from our life. And many of us who have, we have, who have read Holy Mother's life know how there are so many incidents that we can just dwell on, keep on thinking about it and how uplifting that is. But besides these three general gifts that we get from Holy Mother's life, are there any more gifts? And the answer is something that every one of us has to try to discover on our own, to read Holy Mother's life, to see how that is related to our own situation, and to see what the mother is saying to us. Uh, there was this um, great disciple of Ramakrishna. His name was Swami Ramakrishnananda. And he once made a remarkable statement. I was for 15 years in Chennai in Southern India before I came to the United States. And I was at the center, which was started by Swami Ramakrishnananda. So, uh, so this, I, I had made an effort to study and reflect on his life a bit more deeply. And I found in one place, Swami Ramakrishnananda said, he said that a, a Sri Ramakrishna gave a big message for Swami Vivekananda, but a little message was reserved for me. 
I found that statement very intriguing. And that is because what makes a disciple worthy disciple of the teacher or what makes us worthy students of spiritual life? What makes me a worthy spiritual seeker? And the answer it seems to me is that through all of our studies, our understanding and all the reflection that we do, at some point, we have to find out whether all of these study and reflection has, does it have some message for my life or what I should do? And life is trying to teach us in so many different ways. And if we can somehow discover what this higher calling for me is, and then all that we need to do after that is just to work it out in our lives. If we study the lives of Ramakrishna's disciples, we see that every one of them, they shared some common characteristics, of course, but every one of them was also unique, that there was something special that characterized the life of each of them. And one might think that they were working out the message that they received from their teacher. Now, clearly, among all the disciples of Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda name is most prominent, most visible. He's kind of known more than the other disciples are. And so that is why Swami Ramakrishnananda said that he received a big message from Ramakrishna, but I also received a little message. And then I, I thought about it and I was wondering what could have been that little message that Swami Ramakrishnananda got from Ramakrishna. And that's completely speculative because he didn't say exactly what message he got from him. But when we study the lives of all these direct disciples from that perspective, like what was the message they could have got from Ramakrishna and what they were working out? And then we look at our own lives and say, all of these things that I have been reading and practicing all these years, what are the kind of messages that come to me, specifically designed for me? And, and then our life then simply becomes carrying out that message that it comes. And so that's how, if you look at Holy Mother's life and study her life and say, as a, what is it that makes my connection with Holy Mother meaningful to me? Why does her either her appearance or her teaching or her words or her presence resonates with me? What are the kind of uh, message Holy Mother is trying to give to me? Now, the answer to that is going to be different for everyone. And so when I say something now, which I will share very shortly about the two gifts of Mother, those two gifts are the kind of things that struck my heart. But I don't want you to think that two, those two gifts are the only gifts mother has, or those are the main gifts of mother. It doesn't have to be that way. These are the, just a, a sample two gifts that I want to share with you and invite you to make your own independent study, reflection, and practice so that you discover what gifts have come to you personally as a result of this relationship with Holy Mother. So the first gift of Holy Mother, it seems to me, is hope. And clearly, now that we are living in, a, in a, this very extraordinary situation, which none of us thought we would have to, we might see in our lifetime, uh, who would have ever thought, just think about it this way, a little over two years ago, had you ever imagined that Everybody you meet on the street or you go out, everyone will be masked. Everyone would have to be vaccinated. Earlier, we used to ask only about your pets. You get a new pet, get a new dog or a cat. Has the pet, has the pet been vaccinated? And now we are asking that about human beings. Have you been vaccinated? So times have changed and it's really extraordinary times. And while we can kind of smile about it, it's also good to be aware that a lot of people have already lost their lives. Every day, people are dying in this pandemic. There is so much, there's hospitalization, there people have lost their jobs. 
businesses have closed down. So, so it's not something that we can speak about so lightly. And so it's natural in a situation like this to feel a bit hopeless. The hopelessness just seems inbuilt in the current situation. And if that is how we feel, then the right person to go to in a state of hopelessness, not simply because of the pandemic, but for any other reason, then the right person to go to would be Holy Mother. Now, a state of hopelessness can come even in, even in spiritual life. Because when we start our spiritual life in real earnest, in the beginning, people are very hopeful. Some, some of the, sometimes very naively, we think all that we need to do, just kind of meditate and do japa vigorously the first few days, and then zoom and kind of go into samadhi. And maybe some people do. But many of us find that it's a hard grind, that we keep on practicing, we keep on reading, we keep on listening to lectures, we keep on doing this and we're doing that. And it just seems that maybe we are making a little progress, but not enough progress. Maybe it just seems as if the, the destination is just too far off. It just seems as if, oh God, will I realize we have this ultimate experience now, five, after five years, after 10 years, after 20 years, it's so, there is nothing definitely known. And so kind of hopelessness can come even as spiritual seekers. There are days when we might be able to pray with great intensity, and then suddenly there is a very dry period comes in. And then we say, what am I going to do? And the earlier zeal, the earlier focus, the earlier concentration somehow uh, eludes us. And a hopelessness can come even then. And when that happens, again, the right person to go to would be Holy Mother. Now, Mother's life externally looks very ordinary. There isn't that kind of... a this very, um, the very attractive drama kind of that we see the, in, in like Vivekananda, he goes to the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, says sisters and brothers of America, thousands of people get out. And, and it's, it's just filled with exciting thing. And so I remember when, as a student, when I was studying in high school and college, Vivekananda was the hero. He was the one so charismatic and so on. Ramakrishna's life also, we find him going into this samadhi every now and then. There's a lot of things that can attract us even at the very superficial level. But we look at mother's life, outwardly, superficially, doesn't look anything extremely high or extremely uh, inspiring. But then when we look deeply, we take our time, we don't rush to judgment. Then this, the, the power of mother, the glory of mother somehow seems to become more and more real. There's a very inspiring passage from a letter that Swami Premananda, a great disciple of Ramakrishna once wrote. And I would like to read to you a little bit from that one. The, the original letter is in Bengali. This is the English translation of that. So these are Swami Premananda's words, and this is what he says. Who can really understand the greatness of Holy Mother? True it is, there have been great holy women in past ages, such as Sita, Savitri, Sri Radha. But in this present age, before our very eyes, we see Holy Mother surpass them all by her exemplary life. She is difficult to understand because she keeps her superhuman powers hidden. In the life of Sri Ramakrishna, we have seen those powers expressed many times during the day. He would go into ecstasy and samadhi. We saw him always God intoxicated. But mother holds these powers suppressed within herself. How much greater her superhuman power must be. Hail mother, hail mother. That is Jai Ma, Jai Ma. Jai Ma, the embodiment of Shakti, the Divine Mother. 
the the passage that I found worth what a pausing over and reflecting is when he speaks about mother's superhuman powers, which she keeps hidden. Now, when you speak about the superhuman powers of these great beings, it's kind of an, it's a challenge, a little bit of a challenge. A challenge I mean that to know that mother has these tremendous powers to liberate us, to free us from our bondage, to, to pull us out of our ignorance is wonderful. It's, it's of course, it's a great, um, we feel that we are always protected because here is someone who can, who can protect me against all dangers. So that's something that is wonderful. On the negative side of it is that then mother become very less relatable. Okay, then it's like she's so powerful. She's the Devi. She's the, the empress of the universe. She's the divine mother. Uh, and then so she seems so out of reach. On the other hand, if mother did not have the superhuman powers, it was just a human mother, which is good. And human mother is, of course, all of us have and had, have had mothers. All of our mothers are human. And so there is something very assuring in that. But we also know that a human mother that we have can save us from a lot of things, but there are a lot of things that she is incapable of doing. We need a superhuman mother to do that. So they, that's the challenge. How can, if, if, we, if we think of someone way above us, so high above us, that we feel this assurance, but they also go out of reach. If someone is so close to us, and then we feel, well, they are very close, but how can they lift me above? Now, in Mother's Life, we see she bridges this gap so effortlessly that she is this, she has the superhuman powers, and as Swami Prebhananda says, she keeps them hidden. And so we are able to relate to her as our very own, she comes down to our level and we're able to relate to her. And at the same time, she's able to give us this assurance of lifting us out of our limitations. Now, what makes mother uh, a big haven of hope is three factors. One, the first factor is mother's own life. Her life shows us that it is possible to lead spiritual life in any place and under any condition. When you read mother's life, you see uh, a household that probably most of us can relate with. So she had these three brothers, and then of course they were married, their sisters-in-law. So the three sisters-in-law and niece, uh, they were quarreling all the time. There was, there was bickering and uh, the, well, the kind of things you can see in a, in a large household, all the kind of a family politics, if you like, and, the, and the, 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 the fights that occur. Now, mother grew up in such a household. She had all these people around us. And when we read her life, it's so easy to relate. We sometimes, when we read about some, their crazy people around her, we might be able to remember, oh, wow, I've got someone in my own family like that. Maybe my uncle or my aunt or someone like that. And so it's very relatable. But what's beautiful about mother's life is that living in that kind of a, I was almost tempted to say insane household, but, but household which is pretty chaotic in many ways, she was able to keep her mind completely on the divine being, on God. She was able to do her spiritual practices in the midst of all that chaos. Now, if she had lived in some kind of a very quiet retreat in some mountain top, that would have been great also. But then we would have said, well, she had this advantage of living in a quiet place. And so, so we don't have that luxury. We are living here in the right, in the din and bustle of city life. 
and so many commitments, so much responsibility, so many duties. Um, we don't have enough time to do japa and meditation. So we would have had all these excuses. But when we see mother's life, she lived in situations either similar to or probably worse than any of our own, and yet was able to keep her mind entirely on God. We see that we have no basis for complaining of our own situation in life. And mother says, and mother never said, well, I could do it because I'm special. No. What she said was, every one of us can do it. And looking at mother, we get that hope that yes, through her life, through her voluntarily taking upon herself a situation that is not uncommon for many of us, she showed that we can still keep our mind entirely on God, be true to our spiritual life, irrespective of the kind of environment in which we are. So we really have no excuse of that kind. The second thing that gives hope to us is mother's intensely practical teachings. They show us how of everything, how to do this, how to do that. I would go to the extent of saying um, that among the, among the three, the, sometimes we speak about the, the Vedanta Trinity, Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, and Swamiji, I now feel that the mother is the most practical among all of them. Uh, I remember when I was a student and I was studying in college, the hero of my life, the central person in my life was Swami Vivekananda. The small little shrine, a personal shrine I had of my own in my bookshelf. Um, it was Swami Vivekananda who was in the center. Ramakrishna and Holy Mother were uh, at the two sides and Vivekananda was in the center. And I sometimes used to ask myself the question, you know, sometimes when you're very young, you kind of think about all these crazy ideas. And I used to ask and say, what if I was given the option to meet only one of them? That I cannot meet them three, all three of them, but if I were to meet just one of them, who would I want to meet? Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, or Swami Vivekananda. And in, in my teenage years, I had no doubt whatsoever. I always thought, of course, I'm going to meet Swami Vivekananda. If I, if, I, if I had to choose, it's always going to be Swamiji. And then I joined the monastery. And, and I don't know how effort, I, I didn't even realize how and when it happened. So in my little shrine, Swamiji was in the center, he kind of went to the side and Ramakrishna came in the center and then he became the center of my life. Again, it didn't seem like I'm pushing Swamiji away or anything like that. It just, it was a very kind of a natural progression. And as I'm getting older and as time has passed and as I have begun to reflect more deeply on these matters, if I were given that choice again, if I were to ask myself, if I can meet only one of those three, who would I meet? And I think I'm just <laughs> going to meet, I want to meet mother if there was just one of them. So again, they, are, they appear as clearly, historically, Ramakrishna, mother and Swamiji appear as three different people. But in reality, it was this one power that manifested as three. So all them kind of saying all this, this is not to make distinction between them, but how sometimes the way we understand the kind of facet that comes before us might change with age, with maturity, with, with different circumstances. And, and what strikes me now is the practicality of mother's teachings. You look at simple teaching as her la what's called often her last teaching. If you want peace of mind, don't look at anyone's faults, rather see your own faults. And then she says, no one is a stranger, my child. Learn to make the, your, the world your own. The whole world is your own. Now, it's very practical. We know that if you don't find faults, you can be at peace and the people around you can be at peace as well. But she's not saying don't do fault finding at all. 
what she's saying is, see your own faults. And, and the idea is that if I focus on my own faults, then I will see that I'll have little time and interest in trying to look and criticize other people. A lot of times I will notice that the faults that I criticize or condemn in other people, they are there in me as well. And if I see my own faults, and if I try to correct myself, I'll be so busy doing it, I will have no interest in finding faults with other people as well. So I can be at peace and my environment will be peaceful as well. But if you go deeply into that apparently very simple practical teaching, we find it's profoundly philosophical. I won't go into that now, but think about it this way. The whole world is your own. What does it really mean? From a Vedantic perspective, it means that the world is not out there. The, the kind of world I see outside is because the kind of person I am. What I see outside is only a reflection of who I am, is only an expression of who I am. And that is why, although objectively it might appear as if we all are living in the same world, we probably are not. Or let, at least I can say, we are not necessarily seeing the same world. Think about it this way. Think about the time of Sri Ramakrishna. He often said that he was seeing this world as filled with the presence of the Divine Mother. He will say it's the play of the Mother. Shakti ri khela. That's what he said. So this is all a play of the Divine Mother. But even his contemporaries the, people, the other temple staff who lived in Dakshineshwar that time, they were, not, they were not seeing the Divine Mother's play. Now, were they and Ramakrishna living in the same world? Well, objectively, yes. But, but if they were living in the same world, why were they not seeing the same thing? Now, that is what I mean by saying that the world will change for us if we change ourselves. There is this story it could, could be allegorical, but often mentioned in the, in the Mahabharata that once Krishna asked Yudhishthira, the eldest of the Pandavas, to go and find the most selfish person, the most wicked person, and bring him. And he gave another assignment to Duryodhana, the, the Kaurava, the cousin, the, the leader of the Kauravas, Duryodhana, and give him the opposite thing. Find a really good, honest, unselfish person and bring, bring him to me. And then the story goes on to say, both of these people went here and there. And then finally, Yudhishthira comes to Krishna and says, I searched everywhere and I found people are good. People are, people are really wonderful. I could not find a, a, a truly evil person anywhere. And sorry, I couldn't bring anyone. And Duryodhana, who goes out and sees and then returns and re reports to Krishna, everyone is terrible. Everyone is selfish. Everyone are terrible people. Not a single honest, good soul around. And we thought they were living in the same world. And so this is very important. When the kind of impression we find, we, we form about the world, the kind of impression we make about the people around us may sometimes tell us more about ourselves than about them. Because if we were really seeing things as they are, we would be just seeing Brahman everywhere. We would be just seeing God everywhere. So if I'm not seeing God everywhere, if I'm just seeing human beings everywhere, whose fault is it? It's my fault. I'm making that original mistake. If we want to think in terms of the original sin, the, that's the original sin. That instead of seeing the divine, I'm seeing human. So I make the first mistake of not seeing God. And then among human beings, then I make the distinction, oh, this person is good, this person is bad, this person is selfish, this person is unselfish. I'm making all those mistakes first. 
And only when I make that initial mistake of not seeing God, then I'm able to see the faults of other people. And that's what mother meant when she said, rather see your own faults. So as I said, every teaching of mother is very practical, very simple, but when you look deeply into it, it's profound, it's very deep. And that's what gives us hope. Mother's teachings are something we can relate to. We know that they are completely in harmony with the highest philosophical insights we find in the Upanishads. And finally, what gives us hope is that mother is that she is a true mother, not just for this life, but for eternity. There is this incident in the, in the Ramayana. Uh, many of you are familiar with the story of the Ramayana where um, Rama was the eldest prince and he was supposed to be the the coronated as the next king, um, but his stepmother Kaike then comes and seeks these two boons from the king, one by one of which his father says he has to go to the forest in exile for 14 years. And his the younger brother, Bharata, will be coronated king. And so then the Bharata who returns after a few days finds that his eldest brother whom he loved so much has already gone to the forest and um, he has been asked to become the king and he refuses he says no i'm not i'm not the right person for this rama is the one who is going to be the king and that time then they quote the scriptures to him and they tell him no remember what the scriptures say matra devo bhava pitra devo bhava Remember, the scripture says that the divine is present in your father. The divine is present in your mother. And this is, the, this is what your father and mother want you to do. How can you disobey the, what your parents want you to do? Because the scripture says obedience to your parents is the first duty. So scriptures being quoted. And then Bharata tells them what the scripture says is right. Obey your father, obey your mother. Then he says, but who is my father? Who is my mother? And it's a very fascinating conversation you get there. And he says, in every life, every time we are born, I have a set of parents. And in every birth, we don't have the same set of parents. So every birth, I have a different father, a different mother. Um, but he says, Rama, and Sita, he's my divine father. Sita is my divine mother. And they don't change life after life. And the idea is that God as father, God as mother, is our, I mean, that's why sometimes many of the prayers, um, I was studied in a Catholic school. And so what the prayers began with eternal father or almighty father. So eternal father, in a sense that, of course, you know, I'm just kind of, mixing up different theologies here. Uh, but the, the rebirth, the idea of rebirth, we'll have these different fathers, but God is our father that doesn't change life after life. Mother, the Holy Mother is our mother life after life. And so these three things bring us great hope in life. First, that her life shows us that we can lead spiritual life under any and every condition, no matter how hostile it might appear outwardly. Secondly, her intensely practical teachings, which shows us every detail or every difficulty we might experience in spiritual life. And finally, just her being who she is, a mother through eternity. So that's one gift of mother. And a second gift, which I would briefly touch upon is love. Swami Vivekananda said that if spiritual life is to become meaningful, there must be love in our heart. He said that love opens the most impossible gates. And there's a lot that can be said about love. And those of us who have read Swami Vivekananda's book on Bhakti Yoga, The Path of Devotion, uh, know how, what a profound subject it is 
of love, love for God. Now, a Vedantic idea of love is very different from what the word means to most of us. Now, there is a passage in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad which gives a new perspective on the idea of love. And that is, the, the passage says that everything in the world is loved, not for its own sake, but for one's own sake. The Sanskrit goes, Atmanastu kamaya sarvam priyam bhavati. And that kind of makes sense. We are interested only in those things that we are able to relate to in some way. We are interested in only those people with whom we have some relationship or with whom we feel we can relate to. There's, there is some commonality, some common interest, some common, there has to be some, something shareable in order for love to be present. But if every love is to be seen in terms of what it, what it brings to me, uh, then, then it does seems like there is an element of selfishness involved in any loving relationship. Now, even if our motives may not be very grossly selfish, they are fundamentally selfish in the sense that the self is involved in any, any relationship. What we can say philosophically is that every relationship adds some meaning, some artha to our lives. Without that, without that some meaning found in a relationship, that relationship would not be tenable. The Vedanta question is, when all the significance is already in our own heart, is already within us, why do I need anything outside of me to bring me that fulfillment? So commenting on this passage, Shankaracharya in his commentary, this is what Shankaracharya says. He says, our love for other objects is secondary since they contribute to the pleasure of the self. Our love for self alone is primary. So a love for others is the unconscious love for the self. When that unconscious love becomes conscious, then that love will not produce pain and suffering. And this is what Swami Vivekananda points out. With everything that we love outside the self, grief and misery will be the result. If we enjoy everything in the self and as the self, no misery or reaction will come. That is perfect bliss. So in every relationship, if I can somehow see the other person, not as the other, if I can somehow see a part of myself in that person, then that love is unbreakable. Then that love will not be tinged with some of the negativities that can sometimes crop up in life. Because we find sometimes that in relationships, there is truly, there's, there's wonderful uh, bliss and joy and freedom, but relationships also sometimes produce negative feelings. Sometimes there is anger. Sometimes there is um, suspicion, fear, anxiety, envy, jealousy as well. So what, what the science of love, you want to use the word science there, what it says is that the, the freedom and joy that we experience in a relationship, that comes through pure love. Because love can only lead to that kind of a unalloyed bliss and unalloyed freedom. But every negativity that we experience in a relationship, that is not the result of love. That's the result of attachment. So what it means is that most of our attach, uh, relationships are a kind of a mixture of attachment and love. And more the attachment reduces or goes out and only love remains, then that relationship can bring nothing but joy, nothing but freedom. It seems a little um, counterintuitive because we sometimes just think attachment and love are same thing. But actually, no. Attachment is kind of trying to own people, put, put this ownership. And attachment is also, this is mine. 
but it it binds it binds um the word bandhan in in many indian languages they kind of use it positively but without realizing how paradoxical a statement it is in hindi in, in indian language hindi they speak about pyar ka bandhan the bondage of love but that's bondage a true love should only produce freedom and so what vedanta points out is yes whatever freedom we experience in love that in in a relationship that comes through love but all the negative feelings comes through attachment and so only one who is truly detached such a person truly loves so the love of ramakrishna the love of holy mother the love of jesus the love of buddha love of the all of these great saints and mystics and prophets and saviors amongst us that was true love because they were truly detached they didn't have these kind of a narrow clinging attachments to anyone and anything and that is what we see from mother's life that love is not an emotion it is a power and what are the what are the characteristics of true love one might ask so true love is universal it recognizes no distinction true love is fearless it seeks no return of any kind so true love is unconditional giving it produces no misery no anxiety no jealousy a true love is grounded in purity it is an irresistible power which transforms the person or transforms the one who is in love now all of these characteristics of true love are seen present in mother's life she gave this love to all her children during her lifetime and she is continuing to give it even today in belurmat mother's mahasamadhi took place in the year 1920 so that's 102 years ago just a little over 100 years ago and so this was in the july month of july in 1920 and so after her passing the naturally the 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 atmosphere in belurmat had become very gloomy and that time swami shivananda mahapurush maharaj a great disciple of ramakrishna he told he said this to the assembled monks and brahmacharins so swami shivananda said where will mother go leaving her children she has not gone anywhere she is now all pervading previously when she was in one place we had to take the trouble to go and see her now we need not go anywhere wherever we may be if we pray to her with devotion we will receive her grace and see her so in some ways even though we might seem as if we are separated from mother from from such a long time and distance it's easier for us now to see mother if mother were in a human form today we would have had to go all the way to jairambati from here and during the pandemic you couldn't you wouldn't have been able to even travel there and so right now we don't have to do any of that all that we need to do is just sit with a prayerful heart pray with that earnestness like a little child and mother can appear to us right now right here so mother is much more accessible now than she was during her lifetime so i'll conclude by just narrating to you one incident that occurred and then we will conclude with that um over the decades and after mother's passing many earnest disciples and devotees have had this opportunity to see mother have vision of holy mother that assurance that mother has not really gone she is right here right now so we read about such incidents in the books they are there everywhere but here is this one incident that is not too long ago and it occurred um in the early 90s so it's now almost like to 30 close to 30 years ago and it's kind of dear to me because i was there when this incident occurred not exactly in the place but um i know the people uh, who had that experience so this happened in the early 90s when i was in chennai in southern india and um, 
there is a district in southern part of the country called Tirunelveli, and a big cyclone had come and a lot of destruction had occurred in that place. And the Ramakrishna order doesn't have any center there. So because many houses were, uh, had collapsed and there was a lot of damage, we got a phone call in Chennai, which is the northern part of the state, um, requesting that could the monastery have any resources to go and help those people. And so uh, two of our young monks, uh, along with a few volunteers then, went to that place that was affected by that cyclone. Cyclone is closer to what here we might say a hurricane uh, in the United States. So uh, I was not, I didn't go there, so, but I heard about this incident from this group which went there. So these, um, and we didn't know anyone locally, so this group of these two swamis and two or three other volunteers, they reached late in the evening. And um, so they were accommodated in one of the, the public schools there. The building was still standing. So they uh, stayed in one of the classrooms. Now, they were very tired so from that train journey. So as soon as they reached, they just opened up their beddings and just went to sleep. Early next morning, there's a loud knock at the door. And so they opened the door and here is this person with a big, big uh, box filled with food. And he says, this is for you. And then these swamis just couldn't understand. They said, they didn't know who had sent that food. They hadn't asked for anything. There was no door dash or grub hub there to kind of ask for a thing. And early in the morning, suddenly they have come and offering this food. So they said, no, this probably some mistake. We didn't ask for any food. And this person said, no, no, no. Um, I was told to deliver this food here. And he said, who, who sent you here? And then this person, so what these swamis had done was in that classroom, as we normally do when we go to a new place, what they'd done is they had a small picture of Ramakrishna, Holy Mother and Swamiji the kind of a, a, a set of a three, three frames they put in a corner of the room, just kind of a makeshift shrine. And then they had, they had all their beds around. So this person from the door was able to see that. And he pointed at Holy Mother's picture and he said, she is the one, she told me. And these people like had no idea what he was speaking. And this was in 1991. She told you, how come that happened? And then later on, we, they came to know the story. And it was this. So this person, there was a divine mother temple nearby, in the, just adjacent to where the school building was. And this person was a priest who worshipped in that temple. So he and he had his uh, living quarters just next to the temple itself. So he said the previous night, after midnight, he, he woke up with a start. Because he said in his dream, a woman went in his dream and told him, my children have come, go and feed them. And the dream was so vivid, he just got up and he, he, he woke up his wife and said, you know, I got this strange dream. Some woman came in my dream and said, my children have come and feed them. And your wife was deep in sleep and she got up and she just said, you know, just go to sleep again. God knows what, what kind of crazy dreams you get. And so she didn't care for what you're saying. And so he, he, he went to sleep again. But even when he woke up next morning, he just couldn't forget it. He said, no, I just can't forget it. Who was this woman? And what children? And who has come? I have no idea. And finally, just to kind of pacify him, his mother, his, his wife, she said, well, here is this some food I'm cooking now and there is some prasad left from yesterday. And I hear that some group has come from Chennai and they are living in the school there and they've come for some relief work. Um, just go and give it to them. So you'll have some satisfaction that you have helped somebody and whatever dream you got is fulfilled somehow. And that's how this person had come there. And there when he saw on the altar, this picture of mother, he was able to remember the woman who had gone in the dream and said, she is the one. And of course, when he narrated this story, 
these group of volunteers and the two swamis, they would just started crying and naturally because there's tears to know that they had gone to a place they knew nobody. And even there they found the mother was there to take care of them. And that, that's what could be more hopeful than that. That no matter where we are, even though there will be days we may not have seen mother yet, we may not have had mother's vision yet, but she is seeing us. She knows where we are. She knows what we want. She is seeing us all the time. And just like a mother would never let her baby down, never let her baby go hungry, will be always there to support her baby. The Holy Mother is always there for us. But in order to understand that and appreciate that and to not have to ever forget that, we have to become a true child of Holy Mother. So when we read Mother's life, we can ask that question to ourselves. What kind of a person should I be? What kind of a person do I want to be by which mother will be truly proud of me? By which I will feel truly proud of myself and say boldly, I'm a child of Holy Mother, that she is my mother. So these are some of the thoughts that come to my mind when I think about the two gifts of Holy Mother as hope and love. So I would encourage you to make your own independent study and see what kind of gifts come to you as a result of this very divine, eternal relationship that every one of us has with Ramakrishna, with Holy Mother, with Swami Vivekananda, with all these great ones of every tradition of the past, present, and future. So I conclude with my prayer to Sri Ramakrishna, to Holy Mother, and to Swamiji, that may through their infinite grace, our hearts be always filled with love, compassion, and hope. And may we all realize God in this very life itself. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamani Mohur Mohu. So we have received <clears throat> two great gifts and more. Now I request Terence, Dr. Terence Honor, to offer thanks to Maharaj and to our guests. <clears throat> Thank you, Sami. On behalf of Swami Chanchi Karananda's virtual presence, and on behalf of Brother Sri Tanya's virtual presence, we accept your virtual presence here today. And it's such a gift that we cannot hardly measure it. You taught us two, two things very important, the value of true hope, which we now understand comes from the source of all hope, and the value of true love, which comes from the source of true love which is mother's feet and mother's heart. So thank you for sharing that with us. Swami Sashtana said that Portland is, is, is the home of divine mother and the holy mother is the deciding deity there. And I know when you came in 2009, you felt that very strongly and mm -hmm. uh, felt that power that you shared with us today. So that's a great gift and it's truly a blessing to have your presence here today. And don't be a stranger, please come and visit again. Yeah, I remember the great time we had and thank you for taking me for all those hikes and everything. <laughs> so nice to see you both. <laughs> it's because of the gift of Holy Mother that we are meeting <laughs> and the togetherness in this uh, pandemic situation. Though it is virtually, but it's also something is better than nothing. Yes, please go ahead. As Mother once say, come again, come again. Yeah. Have have Maharaj here uh, in Portland, and then we will hope more. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you all, all the guests, and especially my pranams to Maharaj for accepting our invitation. And thank you. 
प्रणाम Swamiji, this is Susie. How are you doing in Balurmat? Great. Very nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, namaste to all. Pranam, Marshal Parash. Namaste. Pranam, Marshal. So interesting how they get those things, you know, like like uh, Swami Shantripanand used to get those, yeah, the, the coloration thing from Shubash. Oh, we're not. 